So I was asked to give my testimony uh, today, and we had a few testimonies shared today. And I gave my testimony a little, a couple hours ago or so. And I thought about it. I thought tonight, you know, about tonight. I thought, have I ever shared my testimony other than a few minutes here and there on a, on a, in 30 years as pastor of the church? I thought people, you know, you know, Chad wanted to give me a testimony for a Good Fight Radio because he was like, people are always asking for your testimony, and I have to send them to the testimony that we have from your presentation, which is kind of a shortened version of it. So I thought, we don't have anything on tape where it's got my entire testimony. I pastored here for 30 years. I'm like, I've never shared my testimony except little bits and pieces. So I thought, you know what? I'll do that tonight uh, because, and hopefully that'll encourage you to share your testimony as well. And I've prayed to share my testimony in such a way where it would be edifying and give you insight into the battle that you're in, the culture war that we're in, the spiritual war that we're in. And uh, because of what God saved me out of and the emphases he put in my heart and in our ministry because of what he had planned for me as a human being uh, was pretty dramatic for me and it's tied to my testimony. And I thought, you know, it's a great way, uh, you know, we were thinking it's a great way for uh, our radio audience to get to know us, especially when we have a two-hour podcast show every week and they'll know who's talking and what they're about. I go, well, actually, the fellowship, most people know me pretty good here that have been here, but a lot of people uh, don't know me, you know, from Adam, so to speak, because uh, now you get to know me a little more. I met a new gal named Miriam. Nice to meet you, Miriam, again. Uh, 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 just a sweet gal. Just ran into her before the service, and she said she saw me in a video. Uh, you said it was Age of Deceit. I need to watch that video because I'm in a lot of videos I don't even know I'm in. <laughs> you liked it, huh? Well, praise the Lord. Praise God. And she said that, that I was a guy that stuck out to her in the video, and she wanted to come in and meet me and stuff and say hi. And, and she's also looking for fellowship. Is that right? Greet her and show her how loving we are. You know, we're a great loving fellowship by the grace of God. You're going to get a lot of hugs before you get out of here, Miriam. Uh, but praise God. So uh, it's a great way to get to know each other by sharing our testimonies. But the ultimate reason I want to share my testimony is to glorify the Lord and show you how powerful he is and what he did not only in my life, but what he's doing in the lives of every believer. Every believer has a testimony. And um, like I said, I'm going to emphasize more of the, the parts of my testimony that will give you insight into what the Lord did in my life in a dramatic way and the way he planned from the beginning before I even existed to use us in ministry and good fight ministry and, and blessed hope and so forth. And there'll be aspects of the, this testimony. You've heard parts of it probably before. Uh, that there'll be parts that you've probably never heard. But, uh, but I'll back up just a little bit and spend just a few minutes in my life up into my late, latter teen years before I came to Christ. And you know, I was born right here in Simi Valley, uh, 19, September 18, 1963. I was born in a doctor's office before they had hospitals in this town. Uh, so I'm a native here. Um, and, you know, uh, five kids in our family, uh, two, you know, father and mother. Uh, they stayed married. Great parents a lot of ways. Uh, we all needed Jesus, though. He was the missing ingredient in our lives. And that showed up from time to time, especially when mom and dad were at work. They both worked. Uh, my mom had become a nurse. My dad um, was involved in the space industry and so forth. And it's interesting because we were known as, you know, at least in our immediate neighborhood, we were pretty much the loudest house in the neighborhood. And uh, pretty much all of us went through the whole drug scene. I think everybody but Kathy, maybe a little bit later, she did, my oldest sister. And... Uh, we had a nominal religious background. None of us knew the Lord. Uh, we were brought to church when we were young, but uh, we got a little bit older. Our parents stopped going to church, and uh, of course, we stopped as well. And the little bit of the Catholic church that I experienced when I was in my cognizant years made me more antagonistic than anything toward Christianity because it was a lot of pageantry, theater. It was so irrelevant to me as a human being, as a youngster, uh, of course, I was in the flesh, and I was living a fleshly life. I didn't know Jesus. I wasn't born again. I was a son of Adam, so to speak, right, with that Adamic nature, a rebellious nature. And I was a very rebellious kid. So, uh, I mean, I was known in the neighborhood and, and my house <laughs> as being the rebellious kid. You know, I think all of us were known at a certain point for being rebellious for the most part, many of us. Uh, 
you know, I don't want to glorify my past and because it was ugly, you know, but in my, in my elementary years, you know, I experienced sex, drugs, and rock and roll, you know, uh, whether it was spinning albums as a youngster or having relationships sexually as an elementary school kid, the girl next door or whatever, pretty bad, and then finding my first joint when I was for, uh, in fourth grade, you know, looking for cigarettes and uh, opening up a pack of cigarettes that was on the ground with my friend Scale is his nickname. He's a few years older than me and realizing there was a joint in there and having never seen a joint before. And he's already spoken pot. We lit it up. And there was my introduction to drugs in fourth grade. And, uh, and then as I hit my junior, uh, junior high years and my high school years, just more and more partying, graduating to you know, speed and uh, uh, LSD, of course, getting drunk, all those kinds of things. Horrible life. Uh, not knowing who Jesus was. Not knowing uh, to walk with God. Always recognizing that there was something beautiful in life, like family, but never really having that strong connection with my family that you really knew intuitively that there should be more, you know? Sometimes I'd have a dream where my whole family would be walking ahead of me on the beach or in a park or wherever, and I couldn't catch up to them, you know? As a little kid, you know? I could never really be close to them like I wanted to. And then I'd wake up, of course, you know, we're friends and stuff, we're doing things, or some of us are partying together. My brother Tom, uh, you know, we'd party together. We had a lot of the same friends and everything. You know, Peggy, you know, I don't want to get into all the ugliness in their lives, but we all had some pretty ugly lives, and we could fight like crazy and then make up. But then, you know, that was kind of my life. I got a lot of uh, some people that go here that, you know, knew me back then, uh, knew I was a brawler. I got a lot of fights. I didn't go up and beat people up and just pick on them, but I was kind of the guy with my arms out, like, you want to threaten me, kind of an attitude, and I, I loved to fight if somebody wanted to fight, you know, and uh, that was just kind of an empty life, you know, kind of a stupid life, really, you know, and when I hit 16 and 17, I was introduced to a lot of music that I didn't even know existed, you know, uh, in junior high, you know, I knew the Eagles and certain bands, but when I hit, like, you know, got a little bit more into music, uh, 16, 17, maybe 15, 16, and 17, I was, uh, Zeppelin, Led Zeppelin just blew me away. I was like, it was like magic, you know, I remember getting, and because they had so many albums out already, and they were still a band at the time, getting physical graffiti on my, you know, my turntable for the first time and hearing it, I knew there was something really powerful that I couldn't put my finger on, I'm like, what? It's like magic. All the riffs, you know, the way Robert Plant sings, all that stuff just floored me. And I was in other bands, like, to a degree, like Sabbath and, and Rush and Hendrix, you know, Neil Young band, you know, sing, uh, solo artists and stuff like that. And I thought it was just, that was became my world, you know. I was still partying and everything else, but music, I was like, wow. It's, it's, it's you know. And you know what? Uh, I got a guitar, and I started learning self-taught to play guitar. And... I got a Fender amp so I could, you know, amplify my sound. And uh, at this time, I wanted to progress in my guitar playing. And I started spending more and more time with my guitar just shredding in my room apart from anybody. And this was, you know, you're talking late 70s, you know, uh, 79, 80. And I was still hanging out with my friends off and on, but I was spending a lot of time on guitar. And at this time... I got a couple books. I didn't get them, but I got a hold of them because they were in my house. One was called The Power of the Subconscious Mind by Joseph Murphy, and the other one is called psycho by uh, Maxwell Maltz. Still have those books. I don't recommend them at all. It's part of my testimony. And in these books, I began to read through these books when I was in you know, high school, and these books talked about how you could program your subconscious mind, how I could basically create my own reality by simply visualizing my success and using self-speak. You know, so I was reading these books and they were considered mind science books, you know. I didn't know about the occult really then. I didn't know that these books would open the demonic world to me, open me up to the demonic world, which is exactly what they did. Because they came in the form and in the guise of mind science and it was supposedly, supposedly based on science. One of them had like the, the innards of a, you know, a brain on the outside of the cover you're looking at a picture of it. So you feel like, oh, this is scientific. And guess what happened? I started visualizing my success, and it was working. Things were happening 
right after I started doing it. A neighbor of mine named Mary Senna, uh, nice lady, but I barely knew her. My mom and the other ladies would get together. I was young, you know, and they'd get together and they'd play cards and smoke and do whatever around the table, four or five of the neighborhood ladies, you know. And, uh, and you know, I would just kind of avoid them usually. you just walk by them until one time, you know, Betty Blinn, who lived right across the street, I walked by, I had the munchies, I was so stoned, and I, I would usually not go in when I was that stoned, and I'd, I walked by the kitchen, to, I didn't realize they're all in there, I opened the door to go get some munchies out of the refrigerator, and there is Betty, and little did I know that she had actually smoked pot as an older lady, found out later, but she said, Thelma, Joe, Joe, look at me, and now I'm looking at her, and my eyes are blue, so when I was stoned, they were really red, and they would just, and she goes, I think your, your, your son's been smoking pot. <laughs> and all of them are like, oh, horrified, you know, it's like heroin at that time. And uh, I ran into the garage, and my mom followed me, and I was like denying it, you know. Didn't know Jesus, you know, denying it left and right. I can't believe she'd say such a thing, you know. And, uh, but she was right. But I didn't know, I barely knew them. I, hello, hi, you know, the kid. And guess what? Mary brings over a, Mary Senna brings over a wizard about three feet high. Long before Harry Potter now. And it's a painted ceramic wizard because she's into painting and art. And she wanted me to have a wizard at my foot of my bed. So now I'm visualizing. I'm visualizing I want to be like that wizard. I want power like that wizard. I want to be, get better on guitar. And guess what happened, guys? Everything changed. I started going into states of paralysis where I couldn't move. It's called sleep paralysis, but with my paralysis, there was something else going on. There was a humming sound, like one continuous note, just like, ooh. No, it's just more like kind of a higher pitch, like, like, ooh, just one continuous note continually, and I'd be laying there, and I'm thinking, the first time it happened, I'm like, they're going to put me in a hospital because I'm paralyzed but they're not going to know this crazy sound is going through my head. You know, I'm like panicking, but I couldn't shake or anything. I couldn't wake up, couldn't get out of it. Boom, it stopped eventually. I was like, whew, seemed like a long time, but it's probably only a minute or two. I don't know, 45 seconds even. I don't know, but it, because it was so intense. Then I thought, I go, wow, this happened the same time I started doing these meditations with these books. I'm doing these things, and things are happening, and now this happened. I thought, I bet there's some kind of connection to my brain that when I do these meditations, Maybe it's like on turbo or something, and I need to really talk to my subconscious mind so it can unleash more power if that ever happens again. Sure enough, boom, it happened again. And I'd be laying in bed, and I'm not knowing that I'm opening myself up to demons, guys, okay? And, and, I, and I don't even doubt a, per, a fraction of a fraction of percent that that's what it was. But at the time, I'm clueless. So it happens again. I'm in a state of paralysis. I'm visualizing my success again. And what happened was... All of a sudden, I'd be up 2, 3 in the morning. I'd be sleeping, and I'd get up, wake up, because there'd be radical concerts jamming in my, in my head. Full-blown music I'd never heard before. I'd just be listening to this music, and it would be so... And you know what? I was into hard rock. I was into Zeppelin and stuff, but I was more of a guitar player. So I was like to play guitar, and I like drums and stuff, but, you know, Bonzo and, you know, Neil Peart and those guys, but... You know what? The guitar should stand out in my mind, but the drumming stood out. It was just such strong drumming. I'd wake up. This music, I think, that just wasn't released yet, and that was going to come in the 80s with the whole heavy metal move, movement because I was more into the guitar, but I'd be like, I'm being given music. And you know what? My whole music style changed. I started tuning my guitar differently. My music became very Eastern, like Arabic or like Hindu. And my friends were tripping out on my sounds and my lyrics. And my, my music was like, like, wah, 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 My friends would be like, that's trippy stuff you play. I still haven't heard that melody anywhere. I mean, I had a lot of stuff like that that would just, you know, that was different. And I was designing musical instruments. I had them all drawn out where I'd have like one had two pillars and had a bunch of notes on both sides of the pillars like 100 or whatever notes on both sides, and then I'd have an axe, and then I'd have picks on both sides of the axe, and it would be like, whoosh, would be like, it'd be tuned to like, a, a, for a riff, whoosh, and, and, and it would be lit up, and then a Ferris wheel looking thing with hundreds of notes, all melodically tuned, so you'd crank the Ferris wheel, and then it would go, 
And that was just before the heavy metal era, which would have been huge in the heavy metal era if they would have thought of that. I was getting this stuff like through like visionary type stuff coming to me. And I'm like, and the name of my band was Beyonder in conceptually in my mind. Beyonder. Just kind of like the doors, you know, break on through to the other side because I was breaking through to the other side. I thought, oh, this is, this is awesome, man. I'm getting all these. And the lyrics I was getting to this day, I can guarantee you, I couldn't even write anything close to the lyrics that I was writing back then because they're beyond what I can write now lyrically because it wasn't me. And I was being turned into a hippie or turned into a, you could say I was being indoctrinated to become a Hindu or a new ager or an occultist through my own lyrics that I was channeling because I was in touch with spirit guides, but I didn't know that, okay? I thought it's my subconscious. Thinking, oh, my subconscious give me all these lyrics. And my friends, people would trip out of my lyrics. And, and I explained them what they meant because I'd have to read them over and over again. And I was becoming a new ager. My whole belief system was being crystallized into an occult worldview through my own lyrics. I didn't think of the lyrics and write them because I had a worldview. I was being indoctrinated by my lyrics. And those lyrics were intended to indoctrinate other people. So I'd write lyrics like, Little Miss Medium, Can You Awaken the Dead Masters of Your Sleep? I didn't know what masters were, and that masters were what mediums, who are mediums from the world beyond, you know, humans that are conduits for satanic powers. In the occult, mediums channel the ascended masters. I'd read that years, you know, later, you know? But when I'm 16 years old getting these lyrics, Little Miss Medium, Can You Waken the Dead Masters of Your Sleep? Or really, you know, writing lyrics backwards. DSL love me, DSL love. And, and that was DSL, not do you still it was DSL, which was LSD backwards. Let me back up a little bit. Before I'm having these experiences, though, I took LSD a handful of times. And a couple times when I took LSD, I had some very, very, very satanic experiences, but I really didn't understand what they were. Be laying down. And by the way, these are very common experiences. I didn't know that the Bible warns, and it uses the word for cuttings, for like cutting drugs in the Old Testament for witchcraft. I didn't know that the New Testament word, I didn't know the God of the Bible, I didn't know the Bible, used the word pharmakeia, pharmacus, pharma, pharmacon as well. Uh, words for contacting the demonic world through drugs. And the Bible would warn about that. I didn't know that. But I, I, I'd lay on the ground in front of my friend Dave Nelson's. Uh, Dave Nelson, I mean, you know, I've got my you know, five brothers and sisters, my brother and my sisters, all five of us, mom and dad. They don't know about these things. My three closest friends then were Steve Riley and uh, Mike Johnson and Dave Nelson, uh, those guys are partying with me. Mike and uh, Dave are doing LSD with me, and I'm laying on the ground in front of Dave's house on the grass, watching all the clouds become dragons just before my eyes. Why dragons of all things, you know? And I'm just and I'm and I go home, and you know I look in the mirror. Because, you know, when you're really drunk or you're stoned, you don't want your parents to know at that age. And I look in the mirror, and I see two, the eyeballs, just the eyeballs, two black eyeballs that are blacker than black, that are like, like a raging fire with an attitude, like a lion, like, ah! And the, I mean, I, I can't explain it to this day, but it was like these black, it's like black fire is looking at me with a hatred and intense, like, I hate you, I'm going to kill you, I'm going to destroy you, with all this power. And I'm like looking at myself like, my face isn't looking like that. The rest of my eyes aren't looking like that. I'm like, what? Like, what did I do? And I had no idea that I'd see that. After I became a Christian later, I'd find out that happens over and over again. When people use shrooms sometimes, when they use LSD, they, oh, you're opening yourself up to the demonic world. And I'm like, what was that? I go into my room another time when I'm on LSD, and all my Led Zeppelin posters, Robert Plant's up there with his hand on his side, and he's got that mic up there, and his shirt opened up, and all the bands, and Jimmy Page has got dragons on his, 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 you know, outfit, you know, the guitar player, and it's just pure, like, devil worship. And in my, my eyes, I'm like, that's like total devil worship, because what happens sometimes when you're on that stuff, it opens up your eyes to the spiritual realm to a degree. But of course, I'm like, what in the world? Well, I don't believe it. I go to bed. I mean, you can't fall asleep because you're up for hours with, with Alice, LSD. It's like, like some you know, speed. And I finally go to sleep. I wake up. I'm like, that was just a, a bad trip. These are just bad trips. I try to explain it all the way. Well, I think that's how I opened myself up to the demonic world. And I rejected the God of Christianity because I had a, the view I was given of him was not, it was my own flesh because I was carnal you know, rebellious, but also the, the view that Catholicism shares of Christianity is very veiled. You don't really get to know who Jesus is 
a lot of focus on Mary and the saints and, and there's a distancing really from Jesus and, and, and confessing your sins to God. You confess him to the priest and so forth. And, and uh, so all those things were working in concert against me. But wow, guess what? I'm finding success. I knew I had something. Now, you know what? I could have just, you know, been playing clubs or something and died two years later and been on the railroad tracks dead. I was a very destructive person, you know? I handled, I think it was a KMET or KLOS. One of them had a uh, art, you know, con- contest. And you'd send in your art and you could, you know, uh, win. I forget what, you know, what award you'd win. But mine was the Curse of the Jays. And it was like this, you know, this kind of new age kind of like weight coming down into a, into a triangle. Same thing that the rock stars use today, right? It was a triangle. That was like a weight, that, and it was all these planets, and they were connected to one another. As everything's connected, and then this, this triangle balances everything, this little pyramid, and makes us all one. But then it was the curse of the Jays, Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin and, and Jim Morrison, you know, and then it would be, and John Lennon, and eventually John, John Bonham. I don't know if I had him on there yet, but it was the Jays. And my name is Joe Schimmel, and I'm going to die young like these guys. Better to, better to burn out than to fade away was my mentality. I sent that in. I'm just saying that's where my mindset was. You know, I was very rebellious and destructive, and it's like burn out, you know, and just, you know. So I'm just going to, you know. So the first song I ever wrote was called My Family or My Soul. And the lyrics were, I was falling forever deeper into the hole. I could not be freed. The devil was grasping my soul. I could hear my mother screaming, and my sisters dreaming, and my father crying, and my brother dying. And at first I was troubled at the devil for the reason and the choice had dawned. It would be my soul or that of my family is to be treason. I could not win to be a devil or a demon. So the cho- I had a choice to make. I could sell all their souls and live and be a rock star or burn myself. Not that that was the real choice, right? And the l- last lines were, um, and there I hit the final bottom and there I lie to say Goodbye. And so I won, or maybe so, and so I left with my soul and began to rock and roll. That's where my lead guitar would come in. And, of course, I don't believe in the devil at the time, so I'm thinking, wow, I'm writing this song about the devil, but you know what? It's just an anthem of how much I love rock music, even more than my own family. I'd sell them out. Of course, I, you know, if you really asked me, I said, yeah, I I wouldn't sell out my own family. It's just a kind of a metaphor for how much I love, you know, music. And I gave that song over to a friend of mine, Mike uh, Johnson, a drummer, and he put the finishing touches on it, and we thought, oh, this is such a cool song, you know? And then, uh, but I'm telling you right now, I was writing songs pushing, you know, strong environmentalism, a song called Beneath the Bark. Like, how does a tree feel beneath the bark, you know? I was writing lyrics like, your God is your myth, a song called Disappointment is Your Friend. And the idea was that, like, the truth will set you free. It was kind of play on that concept. You'll be disappointed to know there's no God, but... Disappointment is your friend. And I believed in some concept of, a, of a, something beyond me. I was more agnostic. I wasn't a straight-out atheist. I knew there was something bigger than me. And I, but I was suppressing the truth still. And what happened was uh, I began, I mean, my s- lyrics were like really morbid. My art instructor, I wrote one song about, you know, uh, you know baby stroller in the creek, madman hangs within the week, you know, curious young is lurk within the trees, hearing for hidden keys, and I did art to that in my art class where there's a, 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 a man hanging from the gallows, and then his wife or pregnant wife was holding his legs, and, and she's got the big baby, and I remember my art instructor saying, man, you've been watching too much Dallas, you know, that was a TV show way back then, you know, and because it was all that dark stuff, but my, it, was, it was reflective of my lyrics and the darkness in my own heart because I didn't know Jesus and I was in rebellion to God and I didn't know up from down, left from right, good from evil. And I was just doing my thing and I thought this was so cool and I knew I had something with my lyrics and my music and I knew that I was getting an understanding of what reality I thought was, but I was totally being deceived. And to give you an example of that, I'm even, I'm writing songs, indoctrinating people into New Age teaching. And as I'm being indoctrinated in myself, I had a song called Secret World. And that was the first song where I actually wrote the title of the song before I wrote the song. And I thought it would be some secret world in outer space, but it was really about inner space. And it was promoting visualization, the very thing I was doing. But I didn't sit down and say, I'm going to write a song promoting visualization. 
I looked at the song, I had to understand it even, you know. First, and I had a beguiling, a really, really seductive, beguiling melody for that song. And the lyrics were, you know, she's, uh, when she sleeps, she builds colorful worlds in her mind. She's the queen who alters time. At her feet, all characters kneel. Through her thoughts, they come and go. She's magically majestic, but explicitly eccentric. Didn't know some of these words back then, guys, okay? And I'd, I'd write about, you know, in her right hand, she holds a wand, and in her left, the bishops and pawns. Very poetic, you know? And how, for, you know, for her love, all drums beat, and servant tress rainbows are her jewels. How many of you gals know what tress means? Most gals don't. I'd be at a, I'd be at a, do a presentation when I was a newer believer, and I'd say, okay, you gals know what trust means. And back then, they were like, no, a lot of them know. And I had to look it up. Trust means to be woven through the hair. Servant trust rainbows are her jewels. I'd never have to change my lyrics. They'd always fit the words. And, you know, this lady, you know, when she wake, awakes to the world, the woman who builds colorful worlds in her mind, she's a queen of altars time. When she wakes to the world as is, where will she go? What will she do? She waits for the night to escape her blues. So she waits for the night because she knows that she can overcome depression or blues through visual, the power of visualization. And she can be her own God, right? You know? So I was pushing the whole concept of being your own God. I was pushing reincarnation. I was pushing occultism, little miss medium. Can you wake in the dead master your sleep? All the lies that are popular in the New Age movement were coming through my music. You know? Pushing hallucinogens. Do you still love me, baby? Do you still love me? And I'll give you one example that I think was the most new agey of my songs that, which was showing, and that indoctrinated me into believing reincarnation and these kinds of things, which the Bible says, it's point of man, how many times? Once to die and after this a judgment. And the Bible doesn't teach reincarnation, it teaches resurrection, amen? amen. So in my song uh, called Society, I was mowing the lawn. Uh, I knew I had to get my chores done because I want to go play football with my friends at the park. We go down there, play tackle football together, have a great time. I, my favorite sport, I can't wait to get down there. I'm on the lawn, I'm almost done. All of a sudden, a character comes in my mind, Tiki Tom, the Indian boy. I'm like, I got a song. I knew, I knew when I had a song, I'm, like, I, I'm almost done. Tiki Tom, the Indian boy, I can feel that I got a song. Later, I would read where John Lennon would say that the song would just have to come out. And he said, it's like being possessed. It's like being a medium, being a psychic. And he said that over and over again regarding his lyrics that they just come through him yeah they did same with the stones two two it was zeppelin those are the three biggest bands ever you know keith richards the top songwriter for the rolling stones says the stone songs come in mass you know all at once and we just it's like we stick our finger in there and they just come through us yeah like songs like sympathy for the devil that's right it's the same spirit i work through all so many of these different artists that are that are huge that because the bible says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood right but against principalities and powers. It's real. It's true. It's what's happening. The rules of the darkness of this world, spiritual weakness in high places. So I go in, and my siblings, some of them are watching like Saturday morning cartoons. I can forget about football now because guess what? I got a song. I'll go there later. First line, Tiki Tom, the Indian boy, stabs to stay afloat in society's leaky boat. I don't know how to use metaphors. I'm clueless. I'm what, 16, 17 years old at this time? And Tiki Tom is in a boat a leaky boat, he's stabbing to stay afloat. The last thing you do if your boat is leaking is what? Stab to stay afloat. I think it was with a, with, a, with a whittled piece of pine. He stabbed to stay afloat and says, size leaky boat. And he's trying to, so it gives a picture of this Indian boy that needs to learn the lessons because he's just a boy from the rest of the tribe, the mystical lessons on how to approach life. Now, I don't stop and think about those lyrics. I write the whole song in like 10, 15 minutes max. Tiki Tom, the Indian boy, stabs a safe float and decides to leak a boat. The next lines, cumbersome timber town, lived and done, winter's wound. Do you know the skies will weep tonight? What does that mean? When I first write it, I'll get back to it later when, after I write the song, but for your sake, because I'm telling it line by line now, cumbersome timber town, look it up, means unfit. I don't know what cumbersome means. Timber town, hmm, huh. Never maybe even heard that word being here in Southern California, but a cumbersome timber town. A timber town would be a town that deals with timber. I surmise, okay, cumbersome, an unfit timber town. Lived and done, winter's wound. It's winter time. Uh-oh, do you know the skies will weep tonight? It's gonna pour. So cumbersome, unfit timber town, lived and done, winter's wound. Do you know the skies will weep tonight? It's gonna pour, that timber town's not ready for it. And poor Tiki Tom, because he's stabbing his stay afloat, size like a boat, it's only gonna get what? 
worse for him, right? That's a whole picture being drawn. Then the next line was asking, is it worth life? Is life worth it? Is all worth life on earth to be a fly, a flower, a president without power, a bum in the park, a priest in the dark, a scalp without hair, a town with no fear? I didn't think that through. Those are not my lyrics. So a lot of you are probably, those are pretty gnarly lyrics. Not mine, not mine, not Joe Schimmel's. I was, I was channeling spirit guides. It's called automatic writing, the occult. I don't know. I think it's my subconscious mind at the time. So, is all worth life on earth to be a fly, a flower, present without power, bum, the park, a priest, dark, scout without hair, a town with no fear? It asks a question. Then it gives the answer. It gives the gospel. Not the gospel of Jesus Christ, the devil's gospel. It gives the new age gospel. The next lines are, born into a world of problems and pleasures of all shapes and sizes. Reach into your mind, you'll find all kinds of surprises. Color and sound are all around. Our greatest senses remain to be found. So it's all about going within, Tiki Tom. Just like the Wizard of Oz. The answer is not Jesus. The answer is Dorothy going within, right? Same lies. By the way, Baum, the German guy that wrote that, was a theosophist, an occultist, and he said he channeled it. This has been happening for a long time, guys. Okay? And then Tiki Tom, you know, by the time you get to the end of the song, Tiki Tom, now a fly in a dark room. What's that? Reincarnation. There it is. Tiki Tom, now a fly in a dark room, struggles to stay afloat in a rippling glass of rum, waiting to be downed by a priest or a bum. So now Tiki Tom's been reincarnated into a fly, the lie of reincarnation, thou shalt surely not die. He's struggling to stay afloat again. He's at the mercy of the priest and the bum. And by the, by the way, guys, I didn't know at the beginning of the song, the fly, Tiki Tom, the bum and the priest were all in the beginning. Is it all worth life on earth? Remember that line? To be a fly, a flower, a prison without power, a bum in the park, a priest in the dark. Somehow the bum in the park gets with the priest in the dark. Maybe a gay relationship. And Tiki Tom's in the middle of it. Try, sorry, I'm going to say afloat. And he can't get out of this cycle of reincarnation, transmigration, until he what? Realizes his inner divinity. That he can be like the queen who alters time, right? He can start tapping into these other senses. And so I'm pushing a whole new age. All the lies from Eden. You go back to Genesis, you can see a lot of the lies right there. What was the lies? Tap into the tree of knowledge, good and evil. That's what Satan wanted. Forbidden knowledge. That's occultism. That's what I was doing. What was the other lie? Thou shalt surely not die. Reincarnation. There's no death. Half God said, Satan said. I had songs like, your God is your myth. Your myth is your God. Disappointment is your friend. That you shall be as God, Satan said to Eve. Yep. What that she builds colorful worlds in her mind. She becomes her own goddess. Tiki Tom needs to unleash these powers within. I was pushing the New Age Gospels. I didn't know that. I didn't know what I was doing. I thought this is just so cool. I'm in touch. My subconscious mind is so powerful. But I didn't understand how does this work though? It's impersonal, right? I'm thinking, how come it's giving me all these lyrics? And how come it's giving me all these devil lyrics? Like treacherous meadows touched by the devil, burdened with calamity and subdued by disease. And you know, uh, the trick here of Satan was bestowed, you know, all these different satanic. I'm like, what is that? Oh, my, I thought I, I would justify it. My subconscious mind is realizing what's going to be popular in the 1980s. And it's just seen ahead of time. So it's giving me these lyrics so they'll fit in with the 1980s. Guess what happened in the 1980s, guys? These kinds of lyrics, okay? By the way, I expose a lot of Satanism, a lot of lyrics and so forth. And I've seen a lot of lyrics through the years. Guess what? Nothing... This, this is like, psh, these, these lyrics, not saying anything about me. I'm nothing, because I'm not bragging, because it's not me. It was never me. I'm just saying it was the demonic world, you know? And as I'm looking at this, and I'm thinking, man, this is amazing. I've really, I'm in touch with this, this, this realm. And, uh, and it, it, the subconscious is so powerful. I'm thinking all of this. By the way, today, there's a constant indoctrination of these same things by top talk show hosts like Oprah Winfrey, right? Always telling people to go within, you know. And she channels spirits, she says, when she acts, you know. It's the same. Satan's got a hold of people. He uses them to teach these same lies through music, through Hollywood. Anybody hear the movie? You probably saw the, the trailer if you didn't see the movie called Glass where that guy crawling, creepy, you know, he's like creepy and he's like, the, <sighs> anyway, see the movie Glass or see the trailer? Okay, yeah, it's pretty creepy, right? Same lies. That thing just came out not too long ago. Guess what? 
this guy Glass is not Glass, the, one of the characters, the main character is possessed by a bunch of different entities. Several different entities that want to use him, that are vying for a position in his life. But guess what? Really, he's a good guy. He's really like a nine-year-old boy stuck in his, in his body that never really grew. And the Beast character, who's called the Beast, comes alive in him and kidnaps girls. It's like a serial killer. But guess what? It's really not bad in the end because Glass... One of the, Samuel Jackson, I think it is, that plays the character Glass. He wants to reveal to the world that we all have these inner powers we just need to let out. Bruce Willis plays another guy who's more like a, a hero who's trying to stop the, the guy that's got all these entities, these multiples in him, these different personalities and so forth. But guess what you find out in the end? There's people trying to suppress these entities and, and these, these superheroes from coming forward and they're actually brutal in how they try to stop them. And they have three-leaf clovers, you find out at the end. The three-leaf clover was a symbol, symbol of Christianity and the Trinity. A lot of people, you know, historically try to say it started with St. Patrick to describe the Trinity as a three-leaf clover. Um, we don't know if that's even historically true of St. Patrick, but we do, or the so-called St. Patrick, but we do know this, that that symbolism these are the guys trying to suppress and keep down because at the end of the movie you find out, guess what? These inner powers... You know, these inner entities, like the beast that possesses this guy and kills people, these are really good. And it's these, these people with the clovers that are trying to suppress them. I thought, yeah, I, it gave me special insight later because after I became a Christian, guess what I realized? You know, uh, <sighs> Josiah, you're not leaving early, are you, buddy? Okay, good. Can mess my son, I can do that to him, right? Uh, anyway, it gave me insight into, after I became a Christian, what Satan was doing on a lot of levels. But before, let me back up again. So what's happening, I'm going through all these experiences, but my experiences become very, very dark to where I'm having covers pulled down. I'll be laying down at night. I'm like probably 17 and a half at this time or so, almost 18. <laughs> covers pulled down a number of times. Like a, kind of like a fly, like a, you're in a horror movie, just zzz, and then there's no fly there. I'm like, what in the world? It just keep happening through the night. And, and I'm like, what? Just very demonic type stuff over and over again. But at the same time, very ecstatic type experiences, feelings and stuff. Like, what in the world? And I'm like, why is my subconscious so confused? You know, why am I writing evil lyrics? Well, my subconscious knows what's going to be popular, as I said. I'm thinking, uh, five or six inches, I don't know how big, like a wave in my water bed. I know it sounds strange, but it's, it really happened more than once. Boom. All of a sudden, a wave starts coming up my bed, just like about that speed or so. And then I get halfway up, I'm like, and I realize what's going on. I get up, ah! And all my, my, my parents, my other kids, I went to bed earlier than them that night, which didn't usually happen, would probably freak out. But I get up, but I couldn't yell. I couldn't even get a, uh, out. I was just, never happened in my life. And I slowly they back down. I realized whatever just did that to my bed is the same forces that are giving me these lyrics. And they're trying to comfort me, you know, or trying to give me this experience. And I freaked out. And they suspended my vocal cords so I wouldn't end up in a mental hospital, maybe. I didn't know. I just laid back down like, whoa, what in the world am I in touch with? This is before I knew it was demonic. Even though I'm having demonic experiences, too. The next time that happens, the same kind of wave, boom, starts coming up. Instead of getting up to yell. This time I'm rolling off the bed. I just reacted. And as I start to roll, very clearly, it wasn't spooky voice. It was just, hold on, hold on. I mean, it was just like that. Hold on, hold on. And I started to pause. I said, no. And then I rolled off my bed, looked in the mirror, screamed, leave me alone. Because guess what? My greatest fears came to pass. This is not my subconscious mind. I'm in touch with spiritual entities and I'm screaming, leave me alone. And I had long hair, you know, so my hair is sticking out like this because I'm wiping my eyes and wiping my nose and I'm bawling, leave me alone because I'm realizing what in the world did I help myself up to? Then I wrote a song. <laughs> and it was probably the worst of the songs because it was probably the only one that I wrote at that time myself. Talking voices in my head. Are they good or are they bad? They shake my bed to comfort me but I see it uncomfortably. The high-pitched buzzing or that humming experience, it's, the high-pitched buzzing will never go. It only seems to want to grow. And I start questioning it. I didn't know the Bible says test the spirits to see whether they're from God, but I was like, I need to know what's going on here. 
Because if Satan's real, I definitely don't want to be on Satan's side. And I thought Satan was a joke. I would mock the idea of Christianity. And guess what? The joke was on me. Satan was playing me like a flute. So the next time, my, my experiences calmed down for a little bit. Because I think they took note that I'm freaked out, like what's going on. But they're not omniscient. They're not all-knowing. And a lot of their subjects and their victims uh, recoil at certain points. I can, I, I, later on when I read, you know, and, and examine the artists that I was into, like Jimi Hendrix, you know, a famed pigeon, his girlfriend he, he said he was standing in the mirror and scream, and he felt he was, he was being tormented by something so evil. I go, yep, been there, been, been in that one, that experience, and that he talked about having this demon cast out of him, but he wanted the music more, so it never happened. He never bowed the knee to Jesus and renounced Satan. He even talked about the power of witchcraft and the power of the so-called, as he called it, subconscious mind uh, equated the two when it's really not the same. So what happened to me is the next time I went through a state of paralysis with that humming sound, I cried out to God, you know. Uh, in the, and it was a feeble, the most pathetic prayer probably ever prayed. One of the most feeble, most pathetic prayer, prayers. But it was good enough for God because he saw a little kid's heart in my heart, he saw that I, I, didn't, I, I wanted what was right deep down. And I said, and I said in my prayer, only in goodness. Like, only if this is good. I said a couple, I don't know how many times this. Only if it's good, only in goodness. But I couldn't move my mouth, keep in mind. I could only, because I was totally paralyzed. But in my heart, I said, only if this is good, it stopped immediately. I could never get that experience to stop. I just have to wait it out. And then I began to, like, talk to it after a while, remember? After the first or second time. And guess what happened? I, right when I did that, it stopped. And I was like, my heart's beating. What in the world? You know? And I thought, oh, wow. You know what? Uh, that means God's real. That means Satan's real. That means Satan is not as powerful as God. And that God actually knows what's going on and sees my thoughts and cares about me and stopped it. Now, I'm thinking of those thoughts, but I'm wondering, too. I didn't think it was a coincidence, but I was like, what? The timing was amazing. A week or two later, the <laughs> same experience. <laughs> Paralyzed, humming sound again, and I cry out more directly to God. God, if this isn't from you, save me. Boom, it stops again. I knew that I knew that I knew, you know? And somewhere in that process, I fell on my knees and said, God, have mercy on me. I probably didn't use the word mercy, but that's what I was crying out for, you know, because I'm so rebellious. And when, when it happened, you know, the first thing that came to my mind was, how could you let this happen to me? And as soon as that thought began to come out of my heart toward God, I didn't know the word repentance or the meaning of repentance, but right away I was like, sorry. Who am I to say, how could you let this happen to me? This was me, you know, this is me doing my thing, you know. And... I went over to my Fender amplifier and kicked it in. I got rid of my guitar. I tore all my wallpaper down, which is all my Zeppelin posters, my lone Jimi Hendrix poster. And I knew that I knew. The bands that I was into, they had way more success. I was just beginning. I, I thought, you know what? There's no doubt in my mind. The, the, they were, you know, these guys are in touch with these same spirits. And I began to read their interviews in the magazines. There was no internet then. Books. And guess what I began to see? The same thing over and over again. They talk about lyrics just coming out of them. The most popular FM song ever, Stairway to Heaven. Robert Plant, who wrote it, said he was with Pagey, as he calls Jimmy Page, at Headley Green Studios. And my hand just started writing. There's a lady who's sure all that glitters is gold. And she's buying a Stairway to Heaven. He said it all came automatically. I'm like, yeah, no, I know what you guys are about. And uh, so what I did is... I began to read the Gospels. I began to read the, open the Bible. And I didn't know God. I didn't know any Christians. I was the only Christian I knew. And I read, I read about what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross. And the first time in years, or maybe ever, I was crying for somebody else. I got teary-eyed for people, but I was like tears streaming because I realized what he had to go through and what he went through for me. And I realized his finished work on the cross. While he died, he paid for my sins so I could be saved and my whole heart had changed. And my whole life was instantly about Jesus. I mean, when I came to him, I recognized that, I mean, even after the first experience, when, and God was, as you know, we say, giving you that, that prevenient grace, first drawing me to himself. Even then, guess what? You know, I, was, I knew uh, 
I didn't think I've got to stop getting stoned. I've got to stop, you know, sexual sin. I've got to, I've got to stop cussing. None of that. I just knew that God, that displeased God. I didn't think about it. It just stopped. Just stopped. I just turned to Jesus, you know, and repented. Now, he showed me other things I need to grow over, you know. Uh, and until this day, we're still being sanctified, but there's, you know, there's aspects of my life he had to deal with me on, but there was such a dramatic conversion because it was so clear to me that heaven and hell, God and Satan are real, and you know what, this life I knew was short, and I'm starting to read the scripture, and then when I'm reading the verses about, you know, the, the tactics of the devil, and we won't rest against flesh and blood, that there's a spiritual war, and that history is linear, and there's a spirit of Antichrist that's against Christ, and that there's a spiritual war going on on this planet, and that, that, that Satan is a spirit that works through the children of disobedience, you know, as he guides the course of this world, I'm like shaking my head, yep, this is the word of God, no doubt about it, and everybody's against this book, and my songs, and all these other bands are all against this book, and they're against this God. So I'd have to wonder if it was Buddha or Muhammad were the way. I knew Jesus was the way. It was no doubt about it in my mind because he was the one the spirits were against. And I found that out to be true in the music as well. Amen? So much entertainment. Isn't that the truth? And so I came to Jesus strong. And now I wanted my friends, I wanted my family to be saved. I wanted all the, everybody to be saved. And my life got totally transformed. And uh, I began to... Uh, do expose, exposes on these things. You know, I found a church, met other Christians, and I realized, wow, there's people that love Jesus, that love his word, that want to know him and want to make him known. And it was just such a beautiful thing that happened in my life to meet other Christians. And I remember uh, doing a presentation in Thousand Oaks at a church over there, and I was invited there to do it. And I started getting invited to a lot of churches to do these presentations on rock music and Satanism because I started just collecting information, reading interviews looking at lyrics because I knew what I'd find and there it was clear as day it all tied together and I remember in uh, Thousand Oaks giving a salvation call for people that wanted to repent and renounce the works of Satan and put their faith in Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and then an older couple came up a very old couple that had just visited the church the pastor told me later a couple times and they were open and boom they came up and turned to Jesus and another lady came up and she came up that was my mom you know, the mom that I wanted a deeper connection with, you know, and then I also got to see my sister Patty, who's right there tonight, you know, and she's always here, you know, uh, faithful and awesome sister, uh, she was a Hesher back then, you know, along with Robbie, our drummer over there, they were both lost at that time, and Robbie's an amazing drummer, amazing guy too, and uh, I remember she came to one of my live presentations at a Baptist church in San Fernando Valley. And she was, she was you know, a meddler kind of thing. Robbie was in, I don't know what band at that time. And they both had the look, the, the, the long, big hair, you know. I don't know whose was bigger, Patty's or Robbie's, but they were both big hair. And they left there. And you know what? Patty, deep down, knew the truth. But, you know, she wasn't ready to give up until she got home. And Robbie and Patty were talking to the, Robbie's dad. And he had, like, managed, like, Night Ranger and the Eagles, right? Couple big bands, and he was telling them, a, a producer of, I think, uh, the movie Heavy Metal, one of the producers, and he was like, oh, you know what, I'm sure a lot of it's for show and what have you, and Patty was like, no, it's not. All of a sudden, she's like, no, you have to see the evidence, and then she was in tears, and God began to do a work in her heart, and uh, she went and found her friend Gail, who was the first person I was able to lead to the Lord, and they confided in each other. They both started following Jesus together at that point. My brother Tom came to Christ, you know. Peggy came to Christ. Uh, uh, later, my sister Kathy came to Christ. All five of us go here to this day, and we've been serving Jesus in this fellowship for the last, I don't know, almost 30 years. <laughs> uh, the last holdout was my dad. He's 92 years old, and he's been coming, as you know, the last eight months. And now my dad, pray for him because he's... Uh, on the, you know, got some dementia going on a bit, and it's showing up a little bit more at times, and, but he's an awesome guy, and he, but he, he went home, and they drove home together uh, the other day, my sister, was it Peggy sharing that with me, or it was you, both you were with him, and then he goes, that preacher today, he's preached really good, <laughs> you know, they go, do you know that's your son, you know, he goes, I forget what he said. Whoa, he preached, that guy preached really good today, <laughs> you know? But praise God he's here, and praise God he's open to the word, you know? And uh, loving Jesus, you know? And uh, they're praying with him. He's got like a, seems like a simple faith right now. And we, my prayer was like, Lord, don't take him. Don't take him until uh, he, he, he turns to Jesus, you know? Because he would be like, uh, when we talk, try to witness to him. It's hard to witness to your own family a lot, Amen. I got to see everyone come, except he, we didn't see him come until more recently because he'd be like, well, he didn't go to church or anything, but, well, Mary answers my prayers, and Dad, it's about Jesus, 
You must be born again. He's the way, the truth, and life. He's the only way, you know. So God turned all that around. My free, three closest friends, you know, Mike Johnson. He was just visiting us here a couple weeks ago. He lives in Montana. Loves Jesus, you know. Stand up for Jesus. Uh, Steve, Steve Riley he comes here. He's a member of our fellowship. Amen. Uh, you know, uh, Dave Nelson. Many of you know Dave Nelson. He went here for years. Moved up to Fraser Park. He, he died a few years back there. Uh, but just all of them came to Jesus. So that doesn't typically happen, but it happened in my life because what Satan meant for evil, and I'm writing a song about my family going to hell for my music, and I'm like, I come to Jesus like, that's messed up. Now I need to bring them to Jesus. And now it's, it's what Satan meant for evil, God turned to good, and they all end up getting saved. Amen? Coming to Jesus. So that was a highlight in my life as seeing each of them get saved and seeing each of them have their own you know, each of my siblings and my mom as well having their own ministries of just reaching out to people and unique ministries of loving people and sharing truth with people and bearing fruit for God's glory. So uh, a lot of things changed. With my mom, though, she got a wake-up call because right after I became a Christian, I'm a Christian for a month or so, and of course, I'm in her mind a Jesus freak. I mean, I could, I'm, t- I'm talking to her and stuff, and I know she's got that look like, what happened to my son? I liked him when he was, you know, with demons or whatever she's taking, you know? And, uh, but I'm like, you need Jesus, you know? You need Jesus, and it's real. And then, you know what? She brings home a, mag- a couple magazines from a false prophetess named Elizabeth Clear Prophet, the I Am Movement, Church Universal Triumphant, an occult. Some of you, uh, is Linda Witt here? Linda Witt uh, co- goes here, and Tom Witt, uh, with Tom Witt and Linda, oh, they're upstairs uh, doing ministry. Uh, they were associated with that cult through her dad, who was an architect for the Malibu, uh, uh, you know, building the temple they're going to build there. They went to Montana and built an underground bunker temple and stuff. Long story, but this lady my mom meets, because she's a nurse at Los Robles there in Thousand Oaks. She comes back to Simi Valley where we're at, and she says, hey, this lady wants you to check out, since you're getting religious, you know, quote, unquote, she wants you to check out these magazines. And I look at these magazines, I start reading through them. They're all colorful. Remember, you know Jay Wilson? He was the one doing a lot of the artwork in Montana for that before he became a Christian. That's how God works, man. He brings people out of darkness to light. I'm looking through it. It's all this new age stuff. It's her channeling St. Germain and other spirits. And I'm like, Mom, 1 Timothy 4.1. You know, I'm quoting scripture all the time because I'm just immersed in the Bible. It says the Holy Spirit speaks, it says in the last days, you know, many, some would depart from faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. This thing's filled with that stuff. And I'm trying to convince her. Then all of a sudden, she gives me a couple cassette tapes of Little Clear Prophet. I go and I'm listening to these cassette tapes and all of a sudden, Liz Claire Prophet says, and when you really get in touch, you know, she goes, you'll hear this sound. Ooh, boom, I turned it, I hit it off. It was cassette player back then, right? Tears in the eyes go to my, my mom, go, check this out. Wow, because she knew my testimony. I go, this is real. There's a spiritual war, you know, that Satan is real and you need Jesus. So it was just neat seeing them come to Christ and, and, and following Jesus and uh, you know and it's a long story of how I got in the ministry but I was doing presentations in a lot of places and we we're seeing a lot of people come to Jesus because back in those days when you're showing all these slides and you're making all these connections there's no internet out people haven't seen this stuff and their eyes are like saucers you can even go watch rock and roll sources of the new age revolution the oldest one the classic you know, when I, was, when I was skinny at 240 pounds, I was always, you know, people say, you're skinny. I was 240 pounds then, you know? And uh, uh, Lenny's even in that. He's in the background. His eyes are like, you know, because it's just so many people just, boom, they come to Jesus. And I was continuing to do that over and over again. And uh, it's another story, because I'm looking at the time, as to how God called me to be a pastor. But the short of that story was I was invited to, to tell us at Christian Center, Hal Lindsey's church, they wanted to film my presentation so we get out in mass. We did that. They filmed it. That, that right before that, though, our Bible study, people that are our Bible study, Jack Haynes, who's here right now, you know, and Jack, we're going to support you when you go to Tennessee. We love you, brother. And he's going to tear it up for Jesus out there, man. Uh, pray for them. Uh, we were praying, and a couple brothers said, Joe, why don't we turn this into a church? We're meeting every Saturday night because we had people like Jack got saved at one of our presentations. Jack, you came to heckle me, right? That's the story. Jack was a fireman. He came to heckle me. And he was going to just, you know, you know, because I'm going to speak against his bands. And then by the time we got to Salvation Call, he said, you were quoting all these verses. And I knew it was all true. He came up as like a magnet, you know, gave his life to Jesus. And Jack has never been the same since. He's been such a beautiful witness for so many people in the fire camps and everywhere else. And, and just we've been able to see a lot of, lot of neat fruit, you know, uh, fruit that God continues to grow through others as well. Uh, but at that time, 
I said, you know, God's going to have to give me sky writing or something just short of sky writing and open a huge door before I become a pastor because I know I'm going to all these churches. I'm seeing people get saved. And there was a lot of revival happening. Guess what? Next week, someone says, Joe, Calvary Chapel left their building. We can have it for free. It's only 400 bucks a month, a year, 40 bucks a year for insurance, but it's free for us to use. That's the answer. I'm like, I said, and something short of sky writing with that. You know, I got to know it's God's will because I hate to get off the road and because I was working full time as a tile setter and I hate to get off the road witnessing because I saw so many people come to Christ. A week or two later after that, a friend of Lisa's and mine from another church from years ago, a gal that was abused by somebody, left that church. She said, man, why am I throwing Jesus out with the bathwater? And she called us up. Oh, she said, she said, God, help me find a church. Help me get back with, back with you. She falls asleep. She has a dream. In her dream, she, she says, Lisa, my dream, it was right after I prayed this. She was in San Fernando Valley at this time, a young gal, a young Jewish gal. She says, Lisa, I can't believe it, you know? I was, I was praying, like, I need to get back with God. I walked by a church, and I went back to the old life and everything. And then in my dream, you guys had a Bible study. And everybody was, like, really, you know, strong converts. Everybody's, ex- like, a commune. Everybody's excited about Jesus. That's exactly how it was. She goes, you guys, were start- you guys were talking about starting a church. Then I woke up. She goes, that's exactly what we're doing. Kim, great, boom, comes to the fellowship. The next, you know, right when the church starts, I think it was, because when I heard that, I was like, Okay, I give up, God. And guess what? Right after that, that's when Tetelestai Christian Center made that video. That video, then we had all those videos without an editor. A long story, but uh, Glenna, remember Doug? Doug brings Glenna. Church just starts. She happens to be an editor for World Vision. She says, hey, give me those tapes. Turns it into Rock and Roll Sorcerers. I said, thank you, Lord. Now it's getting everywhere, a place I could never get. And now I can do a pastoral ministry to where I can also disciple people in the truth of your word. So I'm out of breath. It's, 11, it's 831. I thank you guys for your patience, but I try to give you a Reader's Digest version of what God did in my life. And I'm like, man, I can't believe I've never done this at Blessed Hope. And almost, we've been in church almost 30 years. I can't remember ever having done this. So, uh, but just uh, praise God because Jesus means everything to me. He's the one that saved my life. It's his testimony uh, of what he did for us on the cross. We're his trophies, amen, that he's won. It's by his grace that I've been saved. And I just want to let you guys know that I wondered if God would accept me because I was so dark before I became a Christian. When I read 1 Timothy, or John six thirty seven, Jesus says, whoever comes to me, I won't cast away any. I was like, Whew. praise God. I was looking at his ministry. He never cast people away when they came to him. And then I read what Paul said. He was the worst sinner. He says, it's a faithful saying, 1 Timothy 1, 15 and 16. It's a faithful saying that Jesus Christ came to the world to save sinners of which I'm the chief, Paul said, because he was having Christians killed. And then Paul says, God saved me as a pattern so others in the future, like me, would know that if he saved me, he would save anyone who would come to him. Amen? That made me realize, that was early on in my walk, gave me a sense of assurance, so my assurance was based not on my own uh, works or anything I would do, it was based on the, what Jesus did for me, who he is, that, uh, and I, I read where he tasted death for everyone, that is, well, that any would perish, I didn't have to doubt whether he wanted me or not, and then I began to seek him, and then I began to experience the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of Jesus, sanctification, changing my life, giving me a new life, giving me new desires, giving me a desire to be with him forever, giving me a desire to know him and to make him known, and that's what our, my testimony is about. It's really all about Jesus. The last 30 plus years of my life, you know, since I was 18, I'm 50, uh, 55 right now, have been all about Jesus. And there's not one day I regretted following Jesus. I've never said, you know what, this Jesus. Now I always say, give me more Jesus. I can't get enough. And I've, had, I've been full of joy, full of love, full of God's goodness since that time. The only time I'm not full of those things is when I just need to pray more. Amen. Seek him more. Amen. But my life has just been filled up with him. And I'm just saying this for all of you, that he'll accept you. He loves you. Come to him. Turn to him because he died for you. Amen. And he wants to fill you up with his love. Amen. So now I'm done. Thank you guys very much for listening. I love you guys. I love this fellowship. And I love my brothers and sisters here at Blessed Hope Chapel because uh, you guys are so awesome. And please pray for Good, good Fight Radio. Amen. And pretty soon we'll tell you when we launch it because you're going to be blown away. How would you like to go to a Christian radio station where you don't have to worry about heresy? Amen. You don't have to worry about false teaching. And you could just be encouraged. I mean, there's going to be some different teachers on there. You have to test everything. Something might slip through once in a while that we disagree with. But you know what? It's hard to find something solid these days. Amen. So we wanted there to be something solid. And, and Doug proposed this idea to me. He goes, Joe, you have so much content, almost 30 years of content. That's the hardest thing about a radio station. Let's put that together. And we decided we have these different radio teachers that are 
have very similar viewpoints to us, and uh, although somewhat different as well, as far as, you know, emphases and so forth. So pray for Good Fight Radio. Uh, but you know what? I'm so glad the Lord started Blessed Hope Chapel because it's not just Good Fight Ministries, it's fellowship and all the teachings that's gone out has affected people in a lot of ways that the, the videos never would have. So.